Hey everybody, Ryan Tedder here. Um, I am the uh, founder and CEO of Mad Tasty, the hemp extract, broad spectrum, sparkling water, zero sugar, best tasting, almost no calories uh, beverage in the marketplace. And I have a good friend joining me today that I'm super happy to have, Dr. Jeffrey Chin. Uh, founder and head of the UCLA Cannabis Research Institute or Initiative. Um, he is widely considered amongst experts in this field, the field of cannabis, CBD, uh, as the world's foremost expert. Uh, are, you could make that argument. If not the, then one of the top three. Um, he's too humble to admit it, but that facts are facts. So this guy knows more about CBD and cannabis and hemp extract than arguably any man, any woman alive. Um, we'd like to welcome him to the first uh, inaugural summer sessions of Mad Tasty. Uh, Dr. Chin, thank you for taking uh, your time out of your day today. Uh, I know you're a busy guy and thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm excited to ask you a bunch of questions. Thanks Ryan for having me. Honored to be part of this inaugural uh, uh, summer session, so. Awesome, well, let's get right into it. I've got my cheat sheet right here. I, I've helped draft all these questions, but I just want to make sure I don't miss anything. So Jeff, you and I have been talking about the CBD category for going on a year and a half now. Uh, I, I've discovered you through one of my favorite people on earth, Jonathan Van Ness, his podcast, Getting Curious, stopped me dead in my tracks when I was listening to your episode. It was the first episode I listened to, by the way. And uh, I think that was the end of 2018. I slid into your DMs on Instagram as a... <laughs> proper millennial does and you responded and then we started talking in a friendship and, and talking about all things cannabis and trading ideas and thoughts and whatnot um so can you share your background and uh, just a little bit in the work you're doing at ucla cannabis research research in initiative and and how you convinced one of the foremost universities in the world to create an entire basically department or uh institute dedicated to uh, studying cbd and cannabis Sure. Yeah. And, and first off, I will say I'm, I'm very glad he slid into my DMs. Probably one of the, one of the, <laughs> the, the best moments, best moments of someone just hitting me up out of the blue. Um, the, I'm the least so, gorgeous female to slide into any of your DMs. I can <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, but so, so my story around all this goes back starting about six years ago. And at the time I knew nothing about cannabis. I didn't even know what CBD was. I was just a mild mannered medical student at UCLA and it wasn't taught about in medical school. No one was doing research on it. It was just not on anyone's radar. And I actually learned about CBD from one of my patients that was using it uh, to treat epilepsy and it appeared to be working. And so that blew my mind. And the more that I read about it, the more I realized there needed to be more research, there needed to be more education, but it wasn't happening. And so, by the time 2017 came around, I had just graduated from medical school at UCLA. I'd also just graduated from business school at UCLA. I was part of a specialized program. And I thought to myself, well, I could practice as a doctor and try to spread research and education about these compounds from the hemp and cannabis plant. Or I could try to build an organization that could scale my individual output much in the same way that you built an organization, Ryan. Um, and so I, I, that's when I founded the, the cannabis program at UCLA, and I've been serving in its, its director for the last three years. And, and the, the main three pillars um, of our mission is to do research and conduct education and then proper policy and advocacy research based on the research and data that we get. You're federally here to state and federal guidelines, even in how you research cannabis, uh, presumably, which is not a small hurdle. Yeah, that's exactly correct. And so going back to 1970, cannabis has been classified as a Schedule One drug, which are reserved for the most dangerous drugs in America that have no medical use. That's the definition. It includes drugs like heroin. And so as yeah. a researcher trying to study Schedule One drugs, it's almost impossible. And so yeah. at UCLA, even though we are a public institution in the state of California, which legalized cannabis medically back in the 90s, even to this day, all of our research, all of our projects, every little thing we do follows strict federal guidelines. So we have to go get special DEA permission to study cannabis. We have to go get special FDA 
permission to give it to humans. Uh, we do not take any money from any Buddy remotely involved in um, um, cannabis or, or CBD activities, et cetera. So, I mean, it says a lot, first of all, uh, about CBD um, that the U.S. government is already funding uh, through UCLA uh, studies uh, into this compound, which to me is, is already um, a massive step in the right direction. I'm going to ju jump into my personal experience with CBD, uh, my little quick story that led me to to, to you and to Mad Tasty. And, but I, I wanna front load this interview with a little bit because you kinda already touched on it. For, for the uninitiated, for people who don't know or are, they're learning about CBD and they come from where I come from. I was raised in Oklahoma in the Bible Belt in the church. I was taught definitely never to, to smoke weed, definitely not to drink, don't cuss, don't, you know, all the tenets of, of super conservative Christianity was um, drilled into me from a very, very young age. So like even at a young age, I wasn't allowed to hang out with people or associate with people that might smoke weed. So it was never a thing for me. And to this day, THC, uh, actually smoking joints is not my thing. Tried it, wasn't for me. Um, massive CBD advocate, which I think for a lot of people that are a little trepidatious about a CBD beverage or edible and food and beverage, I think it I would alleviate a lot of their fears. I am you. I am that person that was scared of this and wouldn't touch it, wouldn't, didn't want to be in the room around it my entire life until I personally experienced the health benefits and the anti-anxiety benefits and um, anti-inflammatory benefits of CBD um, without THC, without getting high and all those things. Very, uh, in whatever Cliff's Notes version that you can, I want people that are watching to understand why did, why did cannabis become illegal? And just historically, a little bit of the touch on, if you could, a little bit on the medicinal usages of the cannabis plant and hemp going back and, and using hemp for rope and the fact that hemp was a much bigger crop than cotton and tobacco for a long period yeah. of time. I would love for you to touch on that and when and why it became illegal. Great question. So I think first, maybe some terminology and definitions could be helpful. So, yes. uh, you know, the term marijuana, the term cannabis, the term hemp. The term, you know, devil's lettuce that maybe, you know, it sounds like your community used while you were growing up, like don't touch the devil's lettuce. Devil's lettuce, don't the smoke drugs. Yeah. <laughs> All of these terms are really referring to one species of plant, cannabis, okay? Yep. So cannabis is the scientific name. Um, and cannabis has been used by humanity for at least 10,000 years. Initially, wow. it was used more for its, uh, mainly as rope, because this is before you had really building materials, like rope was everything. Rope held your house together. Rope allowed you to plow field to help you build tools. Rope was very important. Um, yes. And then about 3,000 years ago is when the medical uses of cannabis first start bubbling up in written documents. And it was actually the Chinese that first discovered it. And they named it ma, which is the Chinese word for numbness, because it was used for, uh, they described it being used for pain. And so then you wow. see histor historical references to the medical uses of cannabis in ancient Egypt, ancient Rome, ancient Greece, the Persians, the Indian Hindus, and even all the way to America, where in America, starting in about 1850, cannabis appears in the US pharmacopoeia, which is the official listing of all recognized medicines. And up until the 1930s, you could still, you know, doc, across the nation, doctors could prescribe cannabis, you'd go to a pharmacy, you'd pick it up and you'd use it medically. Wow. Um, right. And then there was this wave of prohibition against cannabis that began. And there's, you know, not to dive too deep into the history, but there's many speculations as to why there was prohibition. And there's probably multiple causes. But one clear, undeniable cause of this, uh, what that historians agree on, was there was definitely an element of, of racism here. And if you look at the first uh, one, of the, one of the champions that got cannabis banned, a guy named Henry Ainslinger, he was, you know, made testimony in front of Congress, quoted by newspapers saying things like, cannabis makes uh, uh, the darkies think they're as good as white men. Cannabis makes oh. like white women, cannabis makes white women want to be with, with, you know, people of color, all this crazy stuff. Um, and so they speculate that 
this was a way to, you know, harass and incarcerate people of color because people of color tended to use cannabis at the time. Um, it was yeah. popular in jazz clubs that African Americans frequented. It was popular, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the other thing about cannabis compared to maybe some other narcotics is it's bulky and it's stinky. It's stinky both in the form that it just sits in and after you use it, right? It reeks <clears throat> compared to say cocaine. You could have a bag yeah. of cocaine, no one's gonna smell it. After you're done using it, no one's gonna smell it. It's not bulky. Yeah. You could hide it, you could hide it behind a credit right. card. But cannabis, yeah. you can't do that. So talk about being able to use probable cause to search somebody's car, enter somebody's house, arrest somebody, frisk somebody, et cetera. And it comes as no, and, and this is the last thing I'll say, it comes as no surprise then that, you know, despite usage rates between say uh, blacks and whites that are approximate, uh, similar usage rates of cannabis. Uh, black people, depending on which state you're in, anywhere from two to eight times more likely to be arrested for cannabis um, than, wow. than 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 non people of color. Um, so so clearly that is kind of embedded into the history of of all of this. Yeah, I, I had heard rumors and in, in, in stories and anecdotes about it there being a, a massive um, racial uh, driver, you know, or race race racism as as a driver behind the um, uh, classification of marijuana. Explain to people how using CBD has almost nothing to do, if not nothing to do with smoking a joint or smoking marijuana, you know, things of that nature. Can you, can you kind of delve into that for a minute? Sure, yeah. And so the, the, what happened was when cannabis became illegal, all things within cannabis also became illegal, including CBD, right? So it's all kind of just been tucked away and, and locked away mm -hmm. under, under these regulations. And it wasn't until a few years ago that some people said, hey, you know, and you, and you mentioned it, Ryan, cannabis used to be one of the major cash crops of the U.S. Um, before it was replaced by, by a combination of tobacco and cotton. In fact, at, at one point, it was actually a legal mandate that farmers in the colonies had to reserve a portion of their property to grow cannabis because the yeah. rope that you can make from it was an issue of national security. So a few years ago, some people got together and said, hey, you know what, we need to bring hemp back as a cash crop. You can build buildings out of it, you can make carbon fiber out of it, it's a source of food, all these awesome things. So here's what we're gonna say. Cannabis, the species of plant, if it has really low THC, let's call it hemp and let's make hemp federally legal. And so suddenly hemp, became legal and all things that you could pull from hemp became federally legal, such as CBD. So that's why now for the first time, you're seeing CBD actually being made available. And that's also now spurred a level of interest in researching CBD that's never existed before. Because before it was all just kind of trapped together yeah. with cannabis. Now, CBD, and THC, despite, sorry, I cut you off. And to, to clarify, um, CBD does not get you high at all. C correct, yeah. So despite both of them being this family of compounds called cannabinoids, which are unique to the cannabis plant, they exist nowhere else in nature, THC is responsible for the intoxicating effects of cannabis, the so-called high. Um, CBD has no such intoxicating effects uh, whatsoever. In fact, there's even some research starting to bubble up that CBD might be able to counteract some of the intoxicating yeah. effects of THC when given together. I've read that and I've read that CBD is also being used to get people off drugs, which is, I find ironic. C correct. Um, so they've and, been, and, and, yep. and to create a, a bit of an analogy for people, when you talked about cannabis becoming illegal and all, it's a plant, okay? In a plant, how many terpenes, how many, how many compounds would you say are, well, you know, how many compounds, unique compounds are in the cannabis plant? Uh, well over a hundred compounds sit in the cannabis plant that exists nowhere else in nature. Making the cannabis plant illegal is by definition, in my opinion, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So there's a compound in the plant that we see to be, uh, have, um, offer euphoric experiences, uh, i.e. THC. Um, so we ditched the entire plant with over a hundred compounds. That's the equivalent of when heroin became illegal saying, well, no more lemon poppy seed muffins. No more right. poppy seed dressing, no more right. poppy seed anything. We should have, if we, were, if we were keeping with the same letter of the law and the same thought process that the U.S. government used with cannabis in other countries, 
they should also have ditched the cocoa plant from which cocaine mm -hmm. is derived and all, right. the, all the innumerable things that that plant is used for. You should also, the poppy seed, the poppy plant should be illegal. That's how you get heroin. And it goes on and on and on. You can see, you can see the, the, I don't want to know if the word's hypocrisy, but the inconsistency mm -hmm. in legislative determination delineating one plant from another and saying, well, this one ditched the whole thing. The rest of these, we're just going to take what we like. We'll make the bad stuff illegal. Um, mm -hmm. All right. So moving off that topic, that really, I think, sets the table for people that are watching on the history of cannabis, the history of CBD. Um, you discovered it. Uh, you got interested in it because you had patients that you knew that were taking it to treat epilepsy. I also have friends that use it to treat epilepsy. The company that I, how I got in, involved in it was I went to high school with a family uh, of 11 children, the oldest of which are a series of brothers called the Stanley Brothers. They started a company called Charlotte's Web, named after a young girl named Charlotte, who was having up to like 16 or 20 seizures a day. Her life expectancy was like eight or nine years old because of her seizures, had an extreme form of epilepsy, and they inadvertently um, created a strain of the cannabis plant that was super high in CBD, super low in THC. And she started using it. And like that, overnight, her seizures went away. As they discovered this, they started developing more and more strains of it and treating more and more children and then discovering all innumerable other uh, benefits, such as uh, curbing anxiety, curbing inflammation. So I want to touch on that. This is what leads me to the creation of Mad Tasty. In 2016, I was burning the candle at both ends. I was traveling 400,000 miles in under six months. I was trying to launch an album, move to Los Angeles, buy a house, sell a house, um, write songs for other people. Uh, uh, like I was doing so many things while not sleeping because my internal clock was so messed up from all the times I was I, I get home late 2016. I'm having heart palpitations. I went to see a doctor. I was like, I'm having heart palpitations. I'm, I am shaking. I'm having a massive anxiety. I can't sleep. Um, he uh, prescribed me Xanax for the first time, which I had been scared of taking you know, my whole life. Um, and I didn't want to be on it. I didn't want to have to be yet another cliche person who's like, let me go pick up my prescriptions because I'm, I'm unwell. And I'm a, a firm believer that they're in, in a holistic approach to um, health. Um, before I'm getting a prescription, I'm trying to figure out, is there na are there natural things I can do to curb this rather than taking um, a pill? So around this time, we get into 2017, um, I start to read in, about CBD and hear about CBD. Um, I got reacquainted with the Stanley Brothers. I got a crash course in CBD from the Stanley Brothers, which is, is just like phenomenal, how much these guys know. And coming from a person who doesn't smoke weed, who was scared his whole life of marijuana. I am the least suspecting person ever to be invested in or start a hemp related company, um, which I think for people watching should maybe rest their mind at ease. I, I'm, this is not, uh, this is not something that I could have imagined three years ago that I would be involved in. And yet here I am full force because i when I got off of Xanax and I started dosing with Charlotte's Web CBD, I was doing 50 milligram tinctures, right? Twice a day. Um, all of a sudden, the mellow, I call it like the mellow, the mellowness kicked in. Uh, the anxiety was, was completely mitigated. Um, it just centered me and focused me, didn't make me tired, didn't make me high. Um, it's hard to explain, but it, I, I try to give people analogies who've never had CBD, how it makes you feel. I said, well, it's kind of like if you have a headache in the morning, like maybe you drank too much the night before you're dehydrated and you have a headache and you take those two Advil or two Aleve or Tylenol, you know, the moment, the moment that kicks in, the moment that headache kind of goes like that, that's kind of how it feels. It's, it's a weird analogy to make because it's obviously not, it's not, um, specifically painkiller, but it is an anti-inflammatory. Um, <clears throat> so it has, it has anti-pain effects. It has anti-anxiety effects. Um, I would, you know, for me personally, once I felt it and realized it wasn't placebo, 
that's when I got really excited. And that's when I started talking with Charlotte's Web. They said, hey, could you help us create a beverage or a consumable that makes CBD more fun and like, like lowers the barrier of entry? And I said, I'd be happy to. So I actually started developing this beverage uh, with Mad Tasty with Charlotte's Web. We splintered off. Now I think we're circling back and, and, and you know, uh, discussing a partnership with Charlotte's Web. But um, I wanted to make dosing CBD more fun, more accessible, um, less medicinal. And I, didn't li- I don't like the taste of olive oil like by itself. And that's where most companies that, that, that do droplet, droppers or what have you, they're mi- it's mixed with olive oil or lemon and olive oil. And I wanted to drink more water. I wanted it to be fun and, and, and be more of a, a lifestyle experiential brand and beverage. And uh, sparkling water is just, that's my go-to anyway. That's my wife's go-to. So basically, I, I wanted to create something for me selfishly that made the CBD experience more effective, more fun, and me more likely to dose 80 or 100 milligrams a day um, regularly with consistency. So look, I know that there's, there's not a lot of CBD micro dosing studies being conducted, but there have been a number of higher dosing studies done and its effect on the body and the mood and growing number of testimonials around curbing anxiety. If you type that into the internet right now, it's now in the hundreds of thousands. But I'm curious, could you open up about the, the current state of microdosing, meaning amounts under 100 milligrams, and that research and, and where you see it proving out efficacy? Sure, yeah. So I think the, the first thing to understand is, you know, because CBD was wrapped up with cannabis for so long, research was so tough, right? And so that's why there's not a lot of official research that's been done. Um, most of it is still stuck at the animal stage of research, where we see, you know, anti-inflammatory effects, um, anti-pain effects, antidepressive, you know, et cetera, et cetera, antioxidant effects, all the way to even anti-cancer effects. Now, albeit this is just in animals. Um, wow, in yeah. humans, in humans, there have been a few studies, right? So we can hang our hats on that human data a little better, um, and we see human data demonstrating that. CBD is effective. We talked about epilepsy. That's one. You mentioned anxiety. That's another where we have human data. You also mentioned being yep. an anti-addictive compound. And that is true. We've shown that um, CBD can reduce uh, cravings in people who have a dependency on things like opioids, right? Um, and you know, another one that's really interesting is CBD also appears to help uh, people who are schizophrenic. It appears to be an, an antipsychotic in people who are schizophrenic. Oh, wow. Interestingly. That's, that's phenomenal. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then CBD use topically has been shown to reduce um, um, pain, um, and and so so you know we have human data on all of these things. Uh, the, the what is unfortunate is that all these studies were just kind of arbitrarily testing amounts of CBD that were over a hundred milligrams a day, um, whereas right now, like you mentioned, with with folks who are using CBD, they're using significantly less quantities, and those quantities have never been officially studied. Um, you're right that the, the, the anecdotes are, there's a mountain of anecdotes. And, and again, I think in the realm of cannabis and CBD, unfortunately, because of the research restrictions, science is always playing catch up. Um, and oftentimes it's the consumers that are informing the scientists what to go test, what's the hypothesis to go test. All right. So for, for instance, the epilepsy thing, that was because there were so many people reporting that it was working is particularly in these uh, kids with epilepsy, these rare forms of epilepsy. That's where the scientists were like, all right, well, let's go investigate this hypothesis in official studies. And so where do I think this is going to go? I mean, clearly uh, people have a researchers have a much stronger interest in studying doses below a hundred milligrams to understand what those effects look like compared to these, these relatively high doses that these studies are using, you know, hundreds of milligrams. Um, in animals, they've done some studies comparing low and high dose CBD, and, and, and at times it exhibits this, um, this paradoxical effect where at really, really, really low doses, you don't see much of an effect. At really, really high doses, you don't see much of an effect, but there's this like sweet spot where the effect suddenly shows up. And then if you yeah. go beyond that, if you give too much, then that effect decreases again. So, so this kind of bell-shaped dose response curve that, that they've observed and some animals using CBD is intriguing. The human has an endocannabinoid system, right? So introducing cannabinoids such as CBD 
to that system helps it to function more effectively and achieve homeostasis, right? Which is the general default setting of how a body should function. And when you introduce CBD to that system, you're boosting it, right? You're giving a little, like, it, is that dissimilar from when you introduce vitamin C or echinacea to your immune system, it functions better. Now, you introduce too much and you end up peeing it out. Your body just doesn't, it, there's that curve where past a certain point of vitamin C, you're, it's not useful. Is there a correlation between those the different systems within the body where, where we know there are certain things you can introduce to those systems that help them to function um, more efficiently? Is there a correlation between that and introducing CBD to the endocannabinoid system that we all have? That, that is such a great question. And first off, uh, science is still trying to figure out how the endocannabinoid system works. It's a relatively new system that we've discovered. And so currently there's no FDA approved medications uh, aside from basically THC and CBD that interact with the endocannabinoid system. So we're still trying to learn better about what the system does, but you, 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 were, you were exactly correct. The goal of the endocannabinoid system is to, is to restore, is to go back to equilibrium, is to promote homeostasis. CBD, we're still trying to figure out how exactly it works. We think it has many mechanisms through which it works. For example, we know that, we know that it, it uh, probably has an effect on serotonin, on the serotonin system. But yeah. also, in, as re, in regards to the endocannabinoid system, it, it appears that one of the ways that CBD might exert all these effects that we're observing is by uh, boosting your body's own endocannabinoid levels. Um, and the analogy you made, yes, there, you can have too much of everything. Um, and that's why in medicine, we call something the therapeutic window. What's that window where you're giving enough so you have an effect? but you're not giving too much that you cause side effects. Dr. Chin, thank you so much for today. This has been so informative. This has been uh, informative for me and hopefully for anybody that watches. I hope this video circles around the internet and, uh, and YouTube and our, our page and just gets passed around because this has been tremendously informative and reminds me, it's reminding me of why I was so blown away by your level of expertise in this topic in the first place, courtesy of Jonathan Van Ness, who knew that he, he would lead us together. Um, thank you for uh, the inaugural summer sessions. I think this is the perfect way to set it off. And um, man, uh, enjoy the rest of your summer. I know we'll be talking quite a bit uh, after this call. Thanks for having me, Ryan. Take care. Be safe.